Hey up, welcome to the Temple of Blet, episode AF. This is a conversation in pursuance of the history of Roadrunner Records with one Mike Gitter. Now, I spoke to Mike before regarding Dragon Forces in Hue and Rampage, but this is what I'm regarding as sort of part one of two, maybe more, if I don't overstay my welcome with him. Uh, about his time at uh, Roadrunner Records, he was the ANR guru who was responsible for lifting acts such as Kill Switch Engage, Glass Jaw, El Nino, uh, to an extent Trivia, many, 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 many more out of the gutter and straight into your lovely ears. At the minute, he is the Vice President of A&R at Century Media, having signed artists including the recent Grammy-minted Body Count, uh, New School Death Metal Legends Frozen Soul, and British Extreme Metal Iconoclast Venom Prism. Uh, so Mike is, uh, is awesome, he kicks tits, and he's extremely accommodating with his time, and as such I want to direct you all to one of his previous ventures, which is the XXX fanzine, 1983 to 1988. So early in his career, Mike authored an influential fanzine on hardcore music, uh, and he collated all those old issues into one comprehensive collection. And you can get that, you just Google it, and you'll find it on Amazon and other places. So buy that and support Mike. Right, let's jump into it. One, two, fuck shit up. Let's do it, man. So one of the things I started out, I sent it, I sent you some questions, obviously, um, but I wanted to start a little bit before then because I, I did my homework and I, I re-listened to the Doc Coyle interview because it is really fucking good. Um, and there's a few gaps I wanted to plug. Yeah, there's a few gaps I wanted to plug on his behalf, which was, um, so we start out in the 80s, fanzining, doing it yourself, um, mm -hmm. and then you move to Atlantic. But what is it? the Atlantic saw in you that made them think this guy's an A&R asset? So there's a natural through line from teenage fanzine years through my quote unquote journalism years uh, straight to my A&R years. And what happened pretty much concurrent with the last couple of years I did, did Triple X was I was covering bands that were important to me in, in bands that, you know, meant something to my world and what happened is those started to be you know bands like white zombie or prong or the rollins band or the ball hole surfers or you know swans and what we had happening was sort of a ramp up to nevermind and when nevermind happened you know it was the tipping point the world changed i think that 15 to 20 years of, of diy development came cascading in and all of a sudden a lot of people who, who labored in the underground got cool jobs and bands that have worked their asses off and, and developed fan bases and developed their sound started to get signed to major labels so I you know and, and that was the stuff I was writing about as a journalist now living in New York City you bump into people and, you know, if, if you're out and you're seeing shows and, you know, you're a regular, you start bumping into other people and, and you start bumping into a lot of people in the music business. And you start, you know, developing friendships with people around them. I mean, what led me to Atlantic was I had become friends with a woman named Wendy Berry, who was the, at that point, was the receptionist at Profile Records. Now, Profile had an in-house label called Rock Hotel, and Rock Hotel had Promags, Leeway, DOA, Murphy's Law, and I would find myself in there as a journalist coming in and interviewing some of these bands. Wendy was a friend of mine. Now, what I didn't know was that her fiancé and eventually her, her husband was Jason Flom, who was the head of a and and a senior VP at Atlantic. So one thing led to another. This is going back to the era when, when major labels would fly writers around to you know, do stories. I was coming back from Los Angeles, having interviewed my old buddy's white zombie and bumped into Jason on a flight. We talked, he started you know, pumping me about bands and we started talking about you know, Helmet and the Obsessed and the Jesus Lizard. And one thing led to another. And a few days after that fateful flight, I got a call from Jason and he said, hey, would you be interested in consulting for us? Okay, cool. I start that. I actually was lucky enough to be in a couple of a &R meetings 
with Amit Erdogan actually chairing the meeting, which was, you know, you're, you're, you, at that point, you're sitting with rock and roll itself. You're sitting with one of like the greatest minds and movers in, in music history, which is, you know, of, of course, I don't know any better. You know, I'm, I'm just like, this is cool. And there were bands I was interested in, bands I was turning them on to. Godflesh was one of the first things that they got excited about. And it, that ended up with Danny Goldberg, who um, was the president of Atlantic Records at the time, and myself going to the UK and sitting down with Justin and Benny from Godflesh and discussing how they were going to become the proverbial next Nine Inch Nails. No, they just became the next Godflesh. And I'm glad that Godflesh is still making amazing records. Um, the second band I brought in was another band with like a very long through line to my, my own history. And that was a band called Jawbox. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, they came from Washington, D.C. They were on Discord. Jay Robbins, the um, guitar player, singer, and, and main dude in the band, was the bass player in Government Issue. I had seen and interviewed him in Government Issue, a band I was in had played their last show with Government Issue. So it was just, you know, it was one of those things. Like, I, I sort of found some way to keep working with the homies. Yeah, yeah. You just sort of leaned into what you were doing already and it just got applied in a different context. At that point, I realized that, that my best position was behind the desk. And luckily, life and profession has been very kind to me. So you'd, how many years are you Atlantic, uh, at Atlantic? It's about two or three, isn't it? Atlantic, 1993 to 1997. Okay. And how was the transition from Atlantic to Roadrunner happen? Is that just through Monty? Well, yes, I was let go from Atlantic in 1997. I had a really good run there. You know, I had signed Jawbox, Bad Religion, Sam I Am, Civ, Orange Nine Millimeter, worked with Clutch, worked with the Melvins, worked with Testament. And obviously music was changing and my tastes were probably not aligning for Atlantic with where music was going. There was definitely a different kind of label that I would probably excel at. So, you know, after having, I think, five different bosses in, in about three years, which was, you know, par for course in yeah. situations like that, I started talking to Monty about a possible position over at Roadrunner. You know, at the time, Howie Abrams, who was someone I had known from the hardcore scene, from yeah. Ineffect Records, from Relativity Records, he was leaving his A&R post at roadrunner to go into the publishing world mm -hmm. and they were they were looking for a replacement for him and you know technically he was the hardcore guy and i kind of fit that mode so i had met with monty and we talked about you know a possible a r position over there i had met with case as well you know it was, it was a good meeting there was there was no real conclusion to it but a few weeks later they hit me up to oversee the making of the second vision of disorder record cool and you know it was it was basically a freelance a and r gig and i ended up hiring dave sardi to make that record and i think that re that record's awesome it's like the the rawest and and gnarliest sounding record you ever want to hear mm -hmm. and it conveyed that band perfectly so once you how did that first meeting with case go then you said it had no conclusion but what was your impression of him because i imagine at this point still the, the, the fact that Case is, a, is an opera guy and a businessman, it still must have been somewhat jarring. You know, that's a naivete of um, youth and inexperience sometimes. You don't recognize the subtext and you don't recognize the winks and the nods. So I came out of that. It was a good lunch around the corner from the Lafayette Street office. Mm -hmm. We sat down, we talked. At one point he said, oh, do you have a hardcore background? And I said, just a little bit. And we, you know, we talked some more. And I think we, we talked about, you know, some of the bands that were a little bit left of center for Roadrunner at that point. You know, bands like Shooty's Groove, mm -hmm. uh, bands like Doggy Dog, bands like Vision of Disorder and, and Shelter. And, you know, we, we shook hands and departed. And, you know, it was hard to sort of get a read and shrug my shoulders and say, okay, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's interesting at the time for Roadrunner, especially 97, because... I talk about this a lot, that, that crazy diversification that they go through from 91. It's even before Nevermind and before the Black Album. There seems mm -hmm. to be an agenda whereby Case is saying, we've got to step away from thrash and death. We've got to start diversifying a little bit more. And I think that was 
why Howie fit the bill really well. And it's also why you fit the bill really well. There's also Ron comes in at around the same time. Well, I think, I think if you go back through the history of it, you know, the, the, there were always bands that weren't the extreme metal model. You know, you had bands like the Neighborhoods. You know, you had, you know, I, I want to say it was the Third Mind stuff. Correct. You know, happening. At, okay, so you had the Third Mind stuff. You know, you even had a band like Gang Green, who definitely a, a priority for the label, hmm. that certainly wasn't like a dyed-in-the-wool extreme metal band. I don't think that that was Case's vision from, from the outset. I think that he wanted, I think ultimately his vision, which he got, was a broad, hard rock label slash presence. I was speaking to Dennis Clute the other week, and he's, he was Case's first employee in 1981. And he shared a picture of um, a gold record he got in 1987 for the Nylons, which is a Canadian a cappella group. Sure, it's still a road a road a gold record, but um, nonetheless, it's not certainly isn't Sepultura or King Diamond. No, and I think what happened is Case had certainly been working, you know, towards that, and he had been licensing a lot of early American underground stuff, even going back to like you know licensing stuff for us from SST and Twin Tone, and eventually, I think when when he started working with Metal Blade. You know, I think he started realizing, like, okay, well, there's there's actually like a real market here, and that sort of pushed him in that that pushed him in that direction. Yeah, I was speaking to Stephen Costa last week, and one thing that you the, the Metal Blade thing cemented was um, the licensing arm. Now, the license usually because my interpretation, the whole thing about this whole project is, is my perception keeps changing as we as we move forward and i quite i find it interesting looking at previous episodes and previous interviews where i have an idea of what the label is and what case is doing and then something happens where i just switch and it changes and last week stefan were talking about the the licensing arm because it was ever so present always present even up to 2012 you were even like you were licensing out like in um sinead o'connor you know what i mean it was it's and I, I always wondered why, because I thought it was pennies to the dollar and maybe Case was just overloading it because he had the contacts and he had the network and it just kept the lights on while the brand was doing the metal thing. And then one thing Stefan said was, it's to keep your distributors happy. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm shortchanging what you were saying, but it's like, if you have IP, whether it's third party or first party, if you're giving it to Alan Becker and the rest of the guys who was, whoever's distributing in Europe, and you've got a 12 month schedule, which keeps them busy as well. It keeps everyone happy. And greasing those wheels of progress is a massive deal. Additionally, there was a second angle to that, which was the territory. And the reason that sort of turned me on be was because everyone refers to Roadrunner as doing really well with corrosion conformity. Mm -hmm. COC weren't a Roadrunner direct sign. However, yep. they, they did do well in Europe. And then it sort of clicked. When the Berlin Wall comes down, you want animosity on the German store shelves. And once that kid goes into the store and sees Roadrunner's name on it, that's not just $15 or Deutsche Marks on, you know, in, in 1989. It could mean 150 Deutsche Marks over the next five years because you're that brand. Well, it's, it's funny that you mentioned COC because that's a band I have a very long history with. But really, Roadrunner was, in, I mean, because they, they never toured Europe. You know, they were, they were one of the few holdouts that, like, for, for the first decade of their existence, they never got over there. I think Roadrunner licensing the Blind Record was instrumental in kicking, in kicking off their European career. And it's, it's, it's just mental how that happens because, again, mm -hmm. it's, it's about... Wait, just change my perspective because I thought the brand was these, you know, the Montes of the world and the, you and, and Howie and everyone just pushing these direct signings. But to someone out in Europe, completely different. You know, and, and the beauty there is the brand was hundreds of people, you know, and, 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 and it's 40, you know, the brand is 40 years of history. And yeah. it's, it's cases push and vision and reach and, you know, some perfect storms mm -hmm. and some, you know, some good choices. Yeah, totally, totally. But it just blew my mind because, again, it, I just thought it was like pennies on the dollar. He's trying to keep the lights on so he can invest elsewhere because why wouldn't you mitigate any risk? No, it's a completely different game. If it's a completely different game to be the certain... Luxembourg's a tiny country. 
if you're distributing in Luxembourg and no one else is, all of a sudden Roadrunner is a particular thing in Luxembourg and that's a big deal. Anyway, I just wanted to share that epiphany because it was, it was for me, it was just like completely blew out of the water. Now you're, you're at Lafayette. You're rolling out of bed every morning and thinking, great, I'm, I'm part of the, the, the big red, the big red giant that is uh, Roadrunner. What's the, what's the A&R function like on a weekly basis? And I'm, I'm relaying that in, in a particular way, because when I was speaking to the UK Roadrunner guys, um, some of the earlier ones, it was a matter of Monday meetings and everyone in the room knew what everyone else was doing. Like you had some people that were going to five gigs a night, some people that were going off and only managing two. And there were some nervous people and some people were like, fuck it, just smash it. What's the mood in these A&R meetings? Actually, I guess the, the better question is, how was it run and who was running it? Well, the A&R meetings happened um, every once every two weeks, um, usually because Case, you know, infallibly was in New York every other week. So he, he basically chaired the meeting. For a large portion of the time that I was there, it was Jonas Naxon who was sort of his second in the meeting. And the mood was, you know, certainly an expectation that we were productive when we were out finding bands mm -hmm. um, and we were out finding new prospects. And it was case, you know, it basically case ran the meetings. And it was like, what do you got? So I think the thing about those meetings, and I think that this, you know, this has shown up in, in the success of Roadrunner's roster over the years, was Case pushed us. You know, Case didn't want the next best version of Sepultura. He didn't want the next suffocation. He wanted, like, what's going to push the genre and define the genre even further? So Case, having, you know, started in the early 60s, had seen a lot of history and it was, although he was never like, impress me, there was a level of like, okay, how are we going to make a mark? How are we going to make a difference, be it out in the community or for this company? Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of like, is this a great band? Is it a great song? Are you going to stand by it? And those meetings could be fun. They could be brutal. They could be, you know, they could be elating. They could be crushing. And, but I, th I think it was always done with, with a mindset of, we want to come out of this with a significant band. It, it's interesting when I, I hear about his A&R sort of function, because he, you can't get anything past him. You couldn't stump your feet and just say, I'm going to stand by this band. If he's not on board, he's not on board. And that's kind of the end of it. Yeah. I mean, he was, look, he was the boss. Um, you could state your case and sometimes there would be bloody fights. And, you know, sometimes Case would say, okay, and, and sometimes it was a shutdown. The thing I think I found over time was, for the most part, he was right. You know, the, the, th the things that got the green light had a higher batting average for success. If a then 50-year-old um, man, or 57, 58-year-old Dutch man could listen to Glassjaw and go, yeah, I kind of get this, you're probably on the right track for market viability. Right. And, and I think that, you know, I mean, there, there were examples of, of things that necessarily didn't get as much play or as much excitement. Uh, Glassjaw is a great example of that because Glassjaw, and, I, and I've, I've said this before, they were a band without context. They were a first of, and the only thing I think we could compare them to at the time was Vision of Disorder. Both bands sort of coming from New York post-hardcore, both bands coming from Long Island. You know, I think that the take on, on that was the hardcore scene is vinyl and viable, but are any of these bands going to break through was probably a question on Case's mind. At the time, what I saw in Glassjaw was a new Deftones or, or a, a band that would continue that legacy of like just cutting against the grain and creating, creating a musical space of, of their own. Yeah, yeah. And at the time, we had um, Ross Robertson's I Am deal at the label. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ross was, somebody I, Ross was somebody I talked to quite a bit. It was sort of like, hey, Ross, check this out. And, you know, I, he loved the initial demos and the initial recordings. And I took him to a rehearsal. The band gets about 30 seconds into the first song, and he's like, stop, stop, stop. I get it. You know, so... That was a little bit of a roundabout way of getting that band signed. But 
I'm, I'm, I'm certainly glad I found that. Yeah, man. <laughs> are there any, speaking about those A&R meetings, are there, any, are there any near misses now that it's been like, what, 24 years? Is there anything that you've heard in that room where you were like, oh, this should really be getting signed? And then let's say, let's say, I know Pantera was an example we cited earlier. Was there any of the near misses like that? I mean, of, of bands I brought, I personally brought in? Any that you brought in, any, any that you saw that someone tried to bring in and it didn't quite make it? The biggest near miss I had was I brought in a band called My Chemical Romance, who, <laughs> you know, who were Jeff from Thursday's weird little friends from Newark playing basement shows, you know, in New Jersey, you know, and I, I thought that Gerard had a really amazing vision and they definitely had some metal underpinnings, some a lot of punk underpinnings. Like the, I thought that they made sense for us. And, you know, I took Case, Monty, Jonas, and myself, you know, went to see them. And, it's, you know, they, they, did, they didn't quite get it or didn't think it was appropriate for the label at the time. I mean, there's definitely, there's always been a few of those. I mean, you know, Thrice was an example of that. You know, they did, just didn't quite get that. I brought Avenged Sevenfold in a meeting. And, you know, you've got to remember that they're sounding, they're sounding the seventh trumpet record sounds a lot like, you know, a bunch of kids learning to play and reaching, reaching for a level that they hadn't mastered yet. Ironically, the first time I saw them, they were opening for Blind Guardian. What? Yeah, it was, it was like this crazy one-off show, but they, I think it was at the Hard Rock Cafe in Times Square. Yeah, Avenge opening for Blind Guardian, but it made sense. In the, in the context of them. I mean, we got pretty far down the road with him. Mm -hmm. also, ultimately, they went to Warner Brothers. There's always that that history of bands, that, the ones that got away. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't mind, by the way, I wouldn't mind having a couple of like platinum level bands in my um, all music guide listings, but that's fine, you know. <laughs> Happy for what I got, man. Yeah, man. I mean, that's, that's fascinating, especially because... Avenge Sevenfold were kind of on brand for the stuff you'd be responsible for in that mid mid two thousand sound. That's so cool. And uh, Michael Chemical Romance, dude, that's crazy. Especially because they're like the New Yorkers band, really, of, of that kind of ilk. What what era was this then? When when you brought those in, was that Three Cheers Street Revenge, or was it the one before? Oh no, it was it was it was, it was like as um the first record was coming out on Eyeball Records. Mm -hmm. You know the, their vision of what they were at the time was probably this weird combination of like the misfits meet at the gates, I think is, is, is how Ray just described it to me at one point. And thank God that they didn't make that record. And the three cheers was like a massive jumping off point and a massive culturally important record. Yeah, that was my heyday, man. Like when I was 16, that was when the album came out. It was, it was playing in all the clubs that we were drinking underage in and all that stuff. That's crazy, man. Absolutely insane. Um, moving on to like the other sort of function of A&R, let's say you brought a band in, let's say you've got the record released. How important is the first week? How at, that at that point, that first week, that first week number was big. You know, it would determine tours. It would determine how executives, you know, MTV, press, basically how the gatekeepers would look at that band. Is this SoundScan and is SoundScan giving you a weekly fax? <laughs> or oh, I don't know what the function is. Um, there was there was something in the front office who pulled sound scan on all of our bands. Okay. Okay. And, was it Doug? And, and I think that, that job fell to the receptionist. Okay, fair enough. Um, fair enough. But, but, but I don't think we had a sound scan subscription, but I think we could access those bands at that point. Right, right. Oh, that's interesting. I need to look into sound scan. I need, because one thing I could really use at some point is understanding the numbers, especially at the time. It would really help contextualize what the label was doing around then, especially when you have like instances like Bloody Kisses, where it doesn't sell too great out of the gate. But nonetheless, Jim Salaby and Doug and, and Case sit down and go, This is our target gold record. This is the one we're going to push. As an asset, I just find it really interesting that that's the one they selected and it was obviously backed by the numbers. And I'd like to see how that data is is reflected and, and sort of transcribed, but um, that's a that's another yeah. podcast. Yeah, definitely. But, it, but what you're saying also points to, you know, the sense of artist development that existed at that point and was particularly, you know, 
a, ma- a major concern at Roadrunner. Mm-hmm. Definitely. There's definitely an angle around. This is something King Down said. I'm, I've only just come off like the 80 to 86 period. So I'm going to make a lot of references to like that right. era band. So forgive me. Um, but he does say a lot. Um, the thing about Brian from Metal Blade and about cases, the communication is absolutely key. Absolutely key in terms of the <laughs> development. And I guess that's that's maybe that what that was the angle they were going for when they were selecting okay well who's the most who can we develop to a point to get to a gold record and i guess that conversation must happen with all the bands at some point well i think i think it's a question of vision i think it's a question of you know surrounding your like as as you know an nr person working with artists who have a, a long-term vision for what they want to do and understand the level of success that they want to attain. But on the opposite end of that, then, there must be some acts which we're bringing in where the understanding is, and I'm thinking Brugera, I guess, is like, uh, Brugeria? Oh, I don't know. Brugeria. Christ, I need to get that fucking right. Um, that's going to be a, an underground record by design. If we break even, sure. great, and we get street cred, that must be another consideration or another viable output. Sure, and there was and there was room for that as well in the Roadrunner roster. Was that culturally completely different from your experience at Atlantic? Well, I, I mean, my experience at Atlantic was was in the post Nevermind Gold Rush. So, the, the you know people were excited for, for the Melvins. People were expecting like, how do the Melvins become the next Soundgarden? And at a certain point, I'm sure they would say like, how does Soundgarden become the next Nirvana? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I think the expectation is get to that massive saturation point a whole bunch faster. And major labels were geared towards, you know, success. And that was just, that was an era where, well, I mean, all labels are, are, are you know, geared towards success. But that was an era also where alternative rock was the dominating force. And these are bands, you know, I know we're harkening back to what we talked about before. But these are bands that largely, they, they had already undergone their sense their artist development, mm-hmm. but their artist development happened unto themselves. They were the ones who sort of played the shows, recorded the records, released the records, pasted up the flyers, you know, and, and basically built a fan base and also in the process developed their sound and, and, and their identity. Yeah, I mean, last time we were talking about Dragon Force and mentioning the bands have their entire lives to write their first record. Mm-hmm. And I guess when you contextualize the entire industry at that point and your experience at Atlantic, it was, like you said, the gold rush and it was looking for that saturation and looking for the, um, looking for the next Nirvana. When you think of it like that, which I think is a very diplomatic and very astute way of looking at how the majors operate because it feels a lot more contextual as opposed to a platinum mindset. Um, but when we think of it like that, moving into Roadrunner, it makes it seem a lot more like the Wild West and a lot more experimental. We had that luxury. You know, and I think we, we had, there was, there was a love for music and there was, there was a love for music and there was a love for the artist. You know, there was a sense of belief in the artist that allowed that to be the culture of that label. But, you know, I think Case's eyes were always on the prize. And I think if you look at the development of Roadrunner from sort of chapter to chapter, I always say like, well, Nickelback was just, that was the end game of well, at that point was even decades of development of a label, of a business. And Sepultura to Fear Factory to Typo to Machine Head to Kill Switch to Slipknot. Mm. All of these bands starting to sell hundreds of thousands of records to gold records to Hey Clown, you know, Hey Chad, we're, 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 we're scratching platinum here. And, and, and that was, that was, I think that that was always case suspicion. You always want to have a big record company. I think um, <clears throat> I've heard some specifics on Case's ambition. I think Case always wanted to break a band, which he must have done a number of times. Mm-hmm. He always he always wanted a platinum record in the US, and he also wanted a number one single in the US. And he he captured all of those in a matter of years. I mean, like without if we disregard breaking a band, because I guess you could say that happened with Merciful Fate back in 83 or whatever, but the platinum and the number one is how you remind me. And it's, um, I don't know where the chronology is. I don't know if Slipknot comes out before Silver Side Up. 
It's but I know it's within like a year of each so, other. Yeah, what was the, what was the first slip, slip down record like ninety nine, and and that capped off you know like years upon years of of artistic and, and business development for you know the label itself, and that was that was the end game, and and, and you know to a certain extent that changed some aspects of the label. You know, it's been called the blessing and the curse. To me, it was always a blessing because that provide you know even though the stakes were higher. It gave. It also gave us the the clout and you know the financials to go sign a Megadeth, to go sign an Opeth, to bring Killswitch Engage to you know a gold level, to you know take a band like Trivium and and push them to the forefront. I mean, it really like it gave us the means to be to be the most powerful kids on the block. Yeah, man. So I talk about a lot on this podcast about. I allude to something that Roadrunner did and it being very important. And I never really elaborate on what that is, but you've kind of just said it there. We've taken fringe music, we've taken fringe things and we made it gold, platinum and commercially viable. And in an era, the dawn of the Simon Cowell era, and we're going toe to toe with, you know, what is regarded as the big guns of the, the industry at the time. And there's, oh, you know what? We've got nine nut jobs in jumpsuits who are going to outsell your guy. And I think that's really important. Metalheads don't care about sales, but we do like knocking people down a peg. Right. And Roadrunner was the vehicle to do it. Sure. I mean, it's Roadrunner set the gold standard. You know, it, 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 you know, and, and there were a lot, there were a lot of great men leaning labels that came up at the time. But Roadrunner, Roadrunner had a business plan. And I, I think I think the strength of like it's been said, well, Case was an opera guy. Yeah, but Case was a businessman a guy with a sense of vision who understood the music industry. And he was just a badass. He enjoyed the journey as much as the destination. And, you know, within almost 30 years, I think he, he, he hit a goal uh, that, most, that most labels, most executives never attain. And I think, you know, in addition to selling a lot of records, he was responsible for a lot of careers a lot of artists, a lot of executives, you know, really launched a powerhouse. And that skill set, the actual resourcing within that that house which he built is now scattered across the industry <clears throat> and is making great things happen on, you know, individuals, individual levels like you, yourself and, and Monty and Michelle Kerr and, and Wally Van Mittendorp. All these people have gone on to pollinate the rest of the industry with their expertise. Urban, Amy Chiaretto. Jonas Naxon, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're many years later, we're all still doing this. And I think we, we all, you know, in our time at Roadrunner, we learned how. Definitely. It's, it's a very special place. I think I've encapsulated why it's important that someone records all this because no, one, no one's written the fucking book yet. So it's a dirty job that someone's got to do it, pal. It's an, it would be, it's an incredible story. You know, I think I think Case and his modesty probably is not one to tell his story. Though I wish he I wish he did, because because it, it's an incredible story of of you know hundreds of incredible people, incredibly talented people, personal highs, personal lows, drugs, death, uh, rock and roll. You know, it, it's 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 such an it's an incredible story unto itself, and I'm. I'm proud and honored to have been a part of it yeah man spoke to brian slagel a few weeks ago and he said no this this is more like a macro look at the culture around metal the metal sort of music industry he said that there was kind of a dibs arrangement between metal blade and roadrunner so if metal blade sort of had the goo goo dolls cornered or were made contact and then mine were cornered roadrunner would keep their hands off and go no oh, they're brian's was that the no bidding wars? I mean, I mean, I don't think those artists of faith were, were, you know, pinned to the wall. But I think, I think it was just sort of a professional courtesy. And you know, I, 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 I was not familiar with that as like a div situation. But you know, Brian, Brian is, is you know a great record company guy. But he's also a tr- you know he's also like a true gentleman. Yeah. And you know, is is a believer that we're you know all in this together, and we're all generally working for the same cause and for the same music. So, sure, you know, let's let let's be cool to each other. Makes sense. There's something about 
listening through to your catalog and your roster th throughout the time. I think it's my age, um, but let's chalk it up to an ignorance at the minute, just you know, a playful ignorance. But every time I listen to say both worlds or Earth Crisis or something, I get transported into Tony Hawk. I get absolutely, I, maybe it's, I don't know if it's a, a product of the time. I don't know if that's what you were going for, even though it was, it was pre Tony Hawk's. But that kind of weird sort of epitaph esque skate culture always resonates with me for some reason. I get that a lot of your bands. But to me, I, I love punk rock, I love hardcore. You know, I come out of music that was a sense on rad. You know, and 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 you know, there was a level of like intensity and honesty and directness. But there's also there's also like some some really great songwriting. But there's a level of it being you know in your face, mm -hmm. and that visceral binding element is still is enormously important to me in music. I was going to ask about how far those bands went because I don't think both worlds got a European release, did it? No, both. Uh, actually, yeah, it did. Um, okay. There was a, there was a Dutch release of the CD. There was maybe a Japanese release. Um, I, I checked. I checked the resource discogs about this the other day, and, and yeah, I believe there was, there was a European, there was a Japanese. I mean, both worlds was a very short-lived band. You know, by the by the time they started working with Rogar, and a lot of that was just you know John Joseph, who is a like, you know, brilliant and hyperactive mind. He has time for music but he, he has also other things to do yeah totally man this this that anecdote itself about european release it, it was it was a lead into another question about how sort of like your investment in the band and how how a a story arc would emerge so i understand that and it's difficult to speak to this in an american sense because a lot of stuff the gen the a and r function in america was very very powerful but i understand that a band that couldn't break their original territory, their home territory, wouldn't see a lot of international releases. Was that about right? I mean, it would depend on the band. You know, it would, it would depend if, if, you know, someone like Mark Palmer, you know, heard it and got it, you know. It would, it would, it would depend if, like, somebody like Hank heard it and was like, hell yes, we're going to break this. I mean, and there, there were records, you know, that, that barely saw European release. In, in my era, you know, certainly Kill Switch, 36 Crazy Fists, Trivium, all received worldwide releases. And, you know, even go back a few years to something like Machine Head, where, you know, that broke out of, you know, that broke out of Europe first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 th I think it was sort of depending on the band and depending on the record. So my perception of that was, just if, if, it does well in the US, it goes abroad. But what we're saying here is it's a collaborative effort. People right. are hearing a lot alive and still breathing and going, fuck yes, over in London and fuck yes, over in France and probably not Japan. I don't know about Japan. I have a, I have a weird relationship and, and research in the Japanese market. Uh, I'll, I'll try and uncover that in, in, this, in this sort of period. But um, no, that's interesting that. That's because it's sometimes you get the impression that when you invest your professional integrity and your your reputation on a band, you you live and die by that band. But really, all you're doing is once you push it into the middle of the table, and everyone else is in, going, "I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it." That must have some. That must have a massive swing in those in those biweekly biweekly fortnightly meetings. Yeah, I mean, look, if, if, if there's a record, you know, if, if it's what separates. You know, the men from the boys is what separates good from great. And when, when, when greatness walks in the room, you know, it's hard to miss. Even Road Runner now, you know, with be with Coda Orange or, or Gojira, that's, that's still the bar. Uh, I read somewhere that you regard El Nino, or El Nino, or however you want to pronounce it. El as Nino. El Nino. That's the accent. The accent over the O is the E-O. Um that secured your longevity at the label. I would have thought it was the misfits. Great A and R, or good A and R, is is finding that finding that band in a club that's you know halfway there, where where you can sort of see and feel greatness to come, and you can start to see people reacting to it, but it's not fully realized yet. 
and and you you become you become part of that realization. It's you know, and Monty and I talk about this a lot. I mean, it's easy to sign sign an established band. And granted, I did sign you know some established quite a few established bands. But you know, to me, the real highlights of an A&R career are those bands that went from went from zeros to heroes. And Il, Il Nino was probably the first one of those that that really broke in a meaningful way. You know, Mis Misfits. Hey, everybody knows the Misfits. The Crimson the Crimson Ghost is you know the smiley face of punk rock. You know, it's the Nike swoosh of punk rock. I think that. Like that wasn't obvious. That was that was that was kind of a gimme when when, when it you know came across my table. I mean, there have been you know, and, and there have been examples of bands that you know, be it be it having the right platform at Roadrunner, um, you know, it being a perfect storm moment, have gone on to to larger success, having been part of you know the Roadrunner roster. I mean, look, Cray of Filth made Nymphetamine, which to me is 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 a career defining great heavy metal record that actually got radio play and, and, and got a Grammy nomination and sold hundreds of thousands of records. Yeah. Um, so that was clearly like a, a leap. I think OPEF came to the label at a time when they were ready to make um, Ghost Reveries, which, you know, is, is, a, is a step ahead of Blackwater Park and, and Deliverance and Damnation. It was the right record at, at the right company. You know, I think that Negadeth signing to Roadrunner after being on Sanctuary was very helpful in, in, you know, sort of them reaffirming their place in the market. It doesn't take as much vision to sign an established band as it does, you know, something that you see in a club and maybe it's still figuring itself out. I mean, you know, the first time I saw Killswitch Engage at the Flywheel in East Hampton, Massachusetts, they were, Adam was on drums and Joel was the only guitar player and Jesse was sort of rollinsing it out and it wasn't there yet, but the sound was there and the elements were there, you know, and, and with El Nino, Dave Shivari is, is probably one of the best organizational band leaders I've ever seen. You know, when it came to putting together El Nino, which came out of the ashes of a band called El Nino, who's, which included members from Marauder and Demolition Hammer and um, Gothic Slam, El Nino was like the perfect band for the moment with a distinct and original sound, but Dave pulled in the right members. He pulled in the right guys with the right natural look who were all great live. And I mean, I saw the, I saw what was ostensibly their first show and there, there were, God, probably three or 400 kids at it, you know, because they had also gotten, you know, some decent airplay on WSOU, our local Jersey, you know, college rock and metal leaning station. So, I mean, that, that was brilliantly put together uh, and it was pretty undeniable. Like, you know, the second, the second time I saw them was a, like a snow jam show at, in Vernon Valley, New Jersey. And it was probably, probably February-ish. I, I have the exact date somewhere. They came off like a band that had been together and had been touring for years already. It was hard not to not walk into a meeting and go, you know, you have this band that like has its shit extremely together, has a distinct and original sound, has a has a multicultural approach that is was probably better realized than you know any band who had attempted at the time. And certainly Case got that. Yeah. It was at the worst case scenario, it was an asset in a package. From yes. a label's perspective, yeah, yeah. Speaking about one thing, I asked Howie all the many moons ago was about um, Sepultura, because I was wondering when Max left in '96. What's the mood in the office on Monday morning? And he said, um, "Well, he was. We we thought it was like temporary. We didn't really know it was going to be a it was going to be an issue until um, you know Derek comes along. So I was going to ask." When Michael Graves walks off stage on October 25th, 1999 or 2000, was it? In the Orlando House of Blues. What's your impression on the Monday morning? Were you like, oh, for fuck's sake. Or were you the same? Like, oh, he'll be back. It was, it was either he'll be back or he'll be replaced, you know, 
or or they'll continue on because you know like I said like I said the the crimson ghost is the smiley face of uh, all culture you know and you also have to remember there were points like when we were working with them where they had other singers they had Mike Hideous from the Empire Hideous did, actually did a very good job and, and I think his his vision on it was sort of like a darker Danzigy, almost Samhainish approach, which worked. And then, and then and I'm trying to remember if this was after Michael, you know, initially left the band. Um, Zoli Tegos came in, and you know, Zoli from Ignite, who I've worked with, is nothing but an incredible singer, and was a Misfits fan and nailed it. And you know, he was a physical presence himself. So it was, you know, it, with with the Misfits, I think it was a lot less important who was there as long as Jerry and Doyle were. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Is it true that you turned Derek on to Sepultura? Speaking of Sepultura. Absolutely. Um, yes. You know, I had I had known Derek from hanging out, you know, from, from like being part of the scene, you know, working door at um, various clubs on the Lower East Side, being in a band called Outface which Charlie uh, Griga, who was also in Civ, who I worked with years before in Atlantic, uh, came out of. And, you know, th there was definitely like, like a push to find a singer for Sepultura. And there were some interesting choices. Uh, Jorge from Marauder, who has, you know, a fa like a fantastic and unforgettable voice, mm -hmm. you know, just didn't, didn't jive with the guys. Also, Davide Gentil, who was the bass player in Orange 9mm, uh, went went down there and, and and it clicked with it clicked with the guys in Sepultura, but for some reason you know I th I think that Davide got cold feet about it. Around that time, there was a very short lived band called Overfiend, and the members of that band were you know Charlie Gariga on guitar and Charlie came from Civ, came from Outface. He's actually now playing guitar in um in Judge. And actually, he's playing guitar in Gorilla Biscuits, too. Sammy Siegler, who had been in every, you know, Revelation band from, you know, probably the time he was 12 years old, um, and is a, was a fantastic drummer. And he was another guy I'd worked with in, in Civ, a bass player named Sarah and Derek. And it was this, like, Pantera meets Integrity wallop. And I thought the demo was great. Mm -hmm. And, um, I you know, I, I turned the Sepultura guys on to it. And they were like, look, here's a singer who isn't the cookie cutter Max clone, but somebody who could, you know, vocally do a bit more mm -hmm. and help develop, develop and, and further grow and refine the Sepultura sound. And he did. Yep. And there's still a force to be reckoned with. And I think it's, it's, yeah. that's a, it's a success story that's not too often dwelled upon, if you ask me. I really like Derek Era stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, Sep Sepultura has become a worldwide force. I mean, it, yes, the the Max era records are you know unsellable. They're great records. That band at that point was you know a band that could take on the world. Mm. But you know, obviously there was a change, and and you know Sepultura, you know, all these years later, still has a career and still has a name, and is still making some. I mean, that Quadra record I thought was one of their best records. Yep. Definitely. Anecdotal question here. Do you know who signed Junkie XL? Uh, I came out of Europe. I believe it came out of Holland. I don't. I don't know the exact name of the person who's. I got beef. That's all. Okay. Now Elvis remix, man. It just it would not stop on British radio when I was a kid. Well, there you go. And 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 now Tom is you know. Doing huge, you know, huge films, yeah. you know, scary Marvel movies, but you also have to remember, like, he was doing, you know, remixes for Fear Factory. Yes, you know, and he was, he was, he was back in that era. So, you know, what a career! Yeah, man. I mean, there's, there's some, there's some through lines in the Roadrunner story with the musicians, right? Where there's some musicians that have, they seem to be joined at the hip with Roadrunner. I can't, and I'm, I'm trying to unpack some of those relationships and understand them a lot more. And I think all roads lead to Roger and United, but I know like Dino is part of that. Reese is part of that. Uh, Rob Flynn's part of that. Junkie X is part of that. It's, 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 
I, I'm trying to, it's just so weird and eclectic. And I, I'm trying to struggle to articulate it because I don't know what it is. Why did Dino lean so much into Roadrunner? Why is he, he's, he's followed Monty to the ends of the earth. And I'd, I'd just love to understand why. And that's not a question. This is just me sort of telling you what I'm going to be up to for the next few weeks, you know? Well, it's because Monty's, Monty's, a, great, Monty's a great guy. He's a great music guy. He's a great record guy. And he took a chance on a lot of these artists, you know, when, when nobody else was all that interested and brought them to a level of success that, you know, none of them expected or anticipated. Yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes regard your business as alchemy because music has no inherent value. It's only value to what people will pay for it. Therefore, what you're done, I said this last time, is reverse engineering the catharsis and packaging it up and trying to make more metal happen. And I think that's magic. So I guess like if you are part of the product that is making, you know, making bank, making a salary, making, putting food on the table through the, with the help of these alchemists, then you're going to, aren't you? You're going to lean into it and you are going to be joined at the hip. I don't think I've ever been referred to as an alchemist, but I guess I'll take it. I quite like that analogy. I think it's a, I think it is ac accurate. The obviously the um, the measure of it being that music isn't worth anything. It's only it's only judged by what people will pay for it, and that's determined entirely by market forces and by the business. I, I'd like to believe it's, it's worth you know it's inherently worth something to begin with. Oh yeah, yeah, but that that requires a conversation. Yeah, that requ that requires context. Because on its own, it is kind of, it is sort of weirdly nothing. We need a culture to back it. We could go down. The, this is another rabbit hole. We could, yeah, it's a, it's a philosophy lecture, I think. Um, I have another weird technical question for you that I thought of in the minutes leading up to our appointment. There's a few instances where Rudder and I have like a split release with someone, but they're kind of one man operations. In this case, it's Glassjaw. So it went out on Rodor and everything you ever wanted to know about silence. It went out on Glassjaw, but also Ross Robinson's This Is I Am recording, right? So the mechanics of that, how does that work? Because I imagine, I, th I thought Ross would have given the band to you and gone, these guys are great. Off you go. I'll take the producer credit. No, I think, I think in, in that case, you know, Ross was, Ross was hot. He was coming off of, of corn, Limp Bizkit, Slipknot. Um, you know, he wants to do an imprint, as, as many people in that position are want to do. And, you know, Roadrunner was, Roadrunner was game, game to give him an imprint, you know, as he had contributed so much to the culture of label anyway, you know, going all the way back to his initial recordings with Fear Factory. Mm -hmm. I'm not privy, you know, to the contracts and I've never seen them. Sure, yeah. I would imagine, I would imagine Ross got an imprint and he got a, a very, you know, substantial advance and override. Um, I would imagine that the, that the contracts remain with Roadrunner. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting for a number of reasons. One, because of that, because the, the Roadrunner deal persists, you know, and then in, in, in terms of publishing an IP, but also giving contributors and employees their own imprints, I think is fucking brilliant because it's, it's going to be a similar thing with Killswitch, right? Because they first come out on Ferret Records. I can't remember the guy's name. Who was the person who was responsible for? Carl Severson. Yeah. I imagine he went to Case and went, look, um, I'd like to start an imprint and I'd like to get experience doing the end-to-end -end process. And Case is like, yeah, I want to develop my own guys. Off you go. But, you know, Case isn't losing anything. Yeah, I don't know. Um, as, far, as, far as, as far as it went with Carl, I mean, obviously he went and with Ferret, you know, did a deal with um, Warner Brothers uh, eventually, you know, and, and the management company, the, the management company around that. I don't, I mean, I, I think there was there were some you know con conversations, but I don't know what they were about. Hmm. Okay. Um, you know, I, interestingly enough, I work with Carl now, as he's the manager of Unearth. Oh, that's cool. So that's awesome. We're still, we're, we're still homies. Everyone's still homies, man. It's a bit. It's just a thing which I know I'm going to end up going into because as we get to the Slipknot era, like every member of Slipknot has their own imprint, and I'm trying. I'm trying to uncover the mechanics of it because there must be some value to it. Um, and I don't even mean monetary. I don't. I'm not trying to get in. I'm not going to try and find where the bodies are buried. I don't give a shit. It's just 
that's an interesting way to do business. And I think that's cool because that's what all case is always about. Well, I think, I, I think what, it, what it did more than anything is it, it example branding. You know, it gave context and it gave branding to these artists. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of what happened with, um, it's kind of inversely what happened with Doggy Dog, right? So Doggy Dogs, was it Doggy Dog or was it Madball? It might have been Madball. Shit. The one where I think they were signed to Warner, but Warner gave Roadrunner one album to, to get Biohazard. street cred. Biohazard. I, that's it. Sorry. Yes, it was Biohazard. Um, so Roadrunner get the first album with them because Warner are saying we want to get street cred on this band before we, we put them out. It's a similar thing. It's just Inception. I mean, those, yeah, and, and, you know, at that point, you know, those were, those were deals that were done occasionally, you know, and, and, and also, you know, wisely, I think a lot of majors, you know, believed in the, saw these bands and believed in these bands and saw, saw the sort of, you know, big picture, but also wisely realized that there was some development needed. So interesting. It's so fucking, yeah. That's all I have for questions at the minute, man. <laughs> That's all? Okay. I have I have many past the Iowa era, but the way I'm breaking it up is I'm trying to do 987 up to Iowa because I I don't know if you saw the first documentary, but I have to chunk it up otherwise. I'm just